Welcome everyone. My name is Gail Kropp and I serve as Vice President of the Board of American Friends of bar -Ilan University. I'm honored to be a supporter of bar -Ilan, a most unique and outstanding institution of excellence in the sciences and the humanities is well known. It is further distinguished as the only university the only institution of higher learning in Israel, which is anchored in Jewish values, learning, and legacy. I am proud to be associated with its contribution to Israel and the Jewish community. Today, we have a very special virtual experience for you, a conversation with Hadassah Lieberman, author of Hadassah, An American Story. Hadassah will be introduced by my dear friend, Ingeborg Rennert. The Rennert's name is synonymous with philanthropy. Inga, along with her husband, Ira, has long supported a broad variety of Jewish organizations and causes, both philanthropically and in leadership roles. They are staunch supporters of bar -Ilan and of many, many other institutions in the United States and Israel. Their charitable efforts have made a profound difference in the lives of thousands and to the state of Israel itself. We are honored to have Inga, a valued member of the Board of American Friends of bar -Ilan University, present a message to Hadassah Lieberman. Hadassah, you have no idea how honored and privileged I feel to address you. I read the book, wrote and cannot describe to you the anguish I felt about you, your family, and most of all the Holocaust. Your entire life was lived being a child of survivors of this horrendous genocide, losing your close family and thinking of the tragic end of their life. As you, my family went with Eli Wiesel of blessed memory to Auschwitz. And like you, we shall never recover from the atrocities which happened there. Which brings me to today, seeing anti-Semitism again in America oh. and the support of the four women screaming against the existence of our beloved homeland. Never again has lost its meaning. Your life has been a triumph of all the ugliness you faced and I am yes. of all your accomplishment and the tribulations you faced and overcame. You are truly an Asia's hire. Also, I'm incredibly happy to see you, your and Joe's happiness. And my happiness is in the fact how you observe our beautiful heritage with love, Inga. Oh. Oh. Mm. Mm. Well, may I may I take over? Yes. Excellent. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Gail. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening to wherever you are. And thank you all for joining us today. My name is Miriam L. Wallach. I am honored to be here today. My thanks to everyone at the American Friends of Bar Ilan University, and specifically, of course, to Lonnie Ostrow, who reached out to me and thought of me for this auspicious event. Um, my thanks as well in advance to Hadassah for taking the time to speak with us today. I give you all my word. I will do my best to keep my remarks and my questions short and tight, for we are here to hear her and for good reason. Her story is not only fascinating, but one that needs to be heard. Hadassah, an American story. This is my copy of the book. I'm just trying to make sure everyone can really see it. While normally I might wait till the end of the interview to hold up a copy of the book so that people can be inspired to purchase it, I want you to all see it in advance for it is filled with notations, it is filled with post-it notes, it is filled with underlined passages that I am totally inspired by. This book is a book you will want to purchase now and purchase for people that you love. It is a story for today. Its relevance is almost startling. 
it may be the story of an immigrant, but it's not just any story. It's a story that is uniquely Hadassah's. It is inspiring, it is full of hope, and it is a reminder, today a very necessary reminder of the greatness of this country. With that, good afternoon, Hadassah, and thank you for joining us. Miriam, thank you. Thank you very much. I want to say thank you before we start to everyone. Gail, thanks. And Inga, a special, special thanks to Inga and all she and Ira have done. And I thank you. And it brings tears to my eyes. Thank you. So let's start at the very beginning, because as one of my favorite lines goes, it is a very good place to start. Please mm -hmm. tell me about Jewish life in Prague before you emigrated to the United States. Well, I was just a little baby. So all I know is right after the war and I didn't know anything. And my parents decided to come to the United States to immigrate there. My father would have wanted to come to Israel. My mother was afraid to go to Israel, 48, 49, with the war going on. Even though we have cousins who went and were given rifles as they got off the ships. So we were in Prague and my parents were married at the Alt Neuschel, which we talked about. And all I knew was when we finally came and immigrated to the United States. So that was now my father went in to the Czech government officials and was registering me as a child. And my name was after my grandmother who perished in Auschwitz. And it was Esther. And my father wanted to say that to this official. And she apparently said, no, no, that's a German name. No, no. So my father quickly said Hadassah, because that's the translation. And then we went off to this country with me. And you came to this country and then the follow-up anecdote about your name, which I find completely fascinating, is how a nun, when processing your immigration papers, encouraged your father to keep the name Hadassah and not revert back to Esther for Hadassah was such a unique name and your father was looking for a more American name potentially and the right. nun was who encouraged him to keep right. the name Hadassah. Which is really part of the story of our immigration. And to have this group of nuns who later during the 2000 campaign, I met some of them, they talked to me. And you know, that's the American story to immigrate to this country and then to have a Catholic nun tell my father, no, keep it Hadassah. And that's our story. And we have to all be mindful of it all the time as good Americans. A hundred percent. And I, I, I find myself as a person is fascinated with names and the origin of a name. And I'm sure that you know that the name Hadassah comes from Hadass, from the myrtle tree. And, yes. and the name, the myrtle tree is, is symbolic and often used literarily to remind us of God's promise and of God's gifts. And I wonder if you often, or if you've thought about the fact that you and your story emulate God's promise and God's gifts. You are a self-fulfilling prophecy. The reason I wrote the book was not out of an ego thing. The reason I wrote the book is I emanated from, it came out of darkness. My mother, Auschwitz, death and liberation. My father coming out of slave labor camp. And that was amazing. And then to go through my life and to end up as the wife of a United States Senator and with the campaigning, it was something I had to do when I found my mother's diary after her death. How surprising was that diary to you? 
shocking. And it's reprinted in the book. It was shocking because she told me odds and ends here and there, my father also. But I never knew some of these details as she walked in, entered into Auschwitz and deliberated from Dachau and the latrines, everything, the bunk beds, all of that awful information, which I had to find out more about as I went through my writing. And, you know, the whole thing, when you look back at it, it seems more shocking than before. And then you hear bad words on the streets today. And we're saying, wait a minute, what is this? Because we heard no anti-Semitism whatsoever in any of our campaigns, whether they be local Connecticut campaigns for attorney general or for the Senate or the national for vice president. And then after in New Hampshire for the primaries for president. So we're very lucky. We never, and people along the way of the campaign would always say, and many times they were Jewish because they were surprised. Is that real? Is that the truth? I'd say, yes, that's the absolute truth. And, you know, as Jews, we have to know our history. We have to believe in our history and we have to live our lives accordingly. But also we have to be able to move forward with the state of Israel as part of our legacy. We really have the gift we have to lose for, move forward with all the time. 100%. The, with a, as a person who is so grounded and so rooted to continue the myrtle tree metaphor. Have you been mm -hmm. back to Prague? Yes, we went, I went back to Prague with Joe for two different official events. And it was amazing. We walked past some of the places that my father had talked about and just had a real sense of things. Yeah, it was incredible. And Shirley Temple was the ambassador at one point in Prague, the American ambassador. I remember seeing her and it was so shocking. Shirley Temple, the ambassador at Prague. So it was a, just all the beautiful sights that, you know, there's so many beautiful things that we know, that we've seen, that we've toured. And then when you hear awful recollections, memories about them as a Jew, it pulls you back, you're afraid. 100%. I am, I am, I'm curious if the, the visits that you took to Prague, were they while your parents were still with you? No, 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 not at Much all. Later. No. My, my parents would not have gone back. My father was afraid to go back ever. These were really later when, now I did go to Prague one summer after I had, before I went to Stern College for two years, it was on a Zionist program that I was part of. And we went to Prague, went to Israel. But then afterwards, I went on official trips with Joe, with you know various leaders at that point in time. So I learned a lot from these meetings that, have, that gave me more to think about, the good and the bad. Would your parents have encouraged you to go? No. When I went, not to steal the questions too early, but when I went to Auschwitz for 2000, I remember telling before it was after 2000 and I was chosen by Bill Clinton's White House to go to Auschwitz. And when I told my mother I was thinking of going. She said, is it safe for you? Can you go? She was shocked. And then I told her I had to go. I had to be there. I had to, and I went in with Ellie Wiesel and others. It was amazing. Would they have, encouraged, would they have encouraged you though to go back to Prague? I mean, would that have been a part of their lives that they would have been comfortable with you seeing? I think, I think they would have felt it would have been an experience 
that I should see, places I should see, but they knew how much had changed after the war. So they, did, they didn't look, they didn't sit around dreaming about my going to any of those places. So it was one of those times that I recall, you know, okay, this is something we're thinking about, but they're not pushing my buttons to leave and go. And Understood. Understood. The um, the inclusion of pictures of photographs in the book um, is is not only a, a great addition to the story, um, but also perfectly centered in the middle of in the middle of the book. It's not. I, I am a person who very much appreciates the design of a book, the construction of a book, and. Um, and the, the placement of those pictures where they are, I find fascinating, especially the picture of you and your husband and your grandchildren in Israel. And what I find yes. about what I find about that picture is something that I don't know that I would have appreciated had the pictures been at the beginning. And I'll and I'll explain what I mean. There is the picture of Senator Lieberman there, he is beaming like a grandfather surrounded by his children, grandchildren in the Holy Land. And then there is the Bubby surrounded by her Anaklach. That's basically the end of my Yiddish, by the way, is Anaklach. So <laughs> sur surrounded by her Anaklach. And there is an expression on her face that I couldn't pinpoint until I realized it was defiance. And there is a sense of defiance and pride in that, in your face in that picture, which to me speaks absolute volumes about who you are and what you represent. That's what I felt. And I felt that before the grandchildren, when Joe was sworn into the Senate, that's the one time we're allowed on, spouses are allowed on the floor. And I remember before he was sworn in, they were going through an orientation and I was sitting next to him on the floor and I looked at him. I said, Joey, what are you thinking? Well, he's looking at the pictures around him of these, you know, well-known figures. And all of a sudden he was sitting there about to be enrolled in this private club of Senate, U.S. Senate. And he looked at me and said, Hadassah, what are you thinking? And I said, my hand, my fist is in the air at Hitler. I've survived. I have survived and here I am. And that touched him as it did me. And it does me now. The, the photograph on the front, on the cover, is this defiance as well? Or is this the picture of an American? You know what? It was the picture that was chosen by publishers and people. And, you know, there are a few other pictures, but it's all defiance in a certain way. It's for those of us who made it as children, as grandchildren, we made it and we're lucky people. Absolutely. It is such a, it is such a story. Mm -hmm. Your, your narrative, your entire um, progression of being, uh, of becoming or being an American from being an immigrant. I loved the anecdote about coming home from kindergarten and telling your mother there was no more Yiddish going to be spoken. Now it takes a feisty kindergartner to... Oh. Well, it's the only way we can learn. We're immigrants. You know, this funny story, I was going down into Manhattan for a meeting. So I thought I'd hitchhike with Joe, who was driven down by his driver. And I was sitting in the back seat with him talking about my chapter on immigration. I just was explaining different things. And the Pakistani driver turned around for a moment and said, Hadassah. I want my children to read that chapter on immigration. And I was so touched by that. And I thought, you know, I really have to try to 
get my book to some immigrants because we share the, you know, we don't have the same language. We don't have the same customs. We don't have the same foods. We're strangers in a strange land as immigrants until you bond. And I was so happy to be able to tell this story with love and light, because that's what I found as I went on. The light enters in and the light exits out to help others. And there's this moment of the, the, a, a, a line in this passage about just wanting to live as Americans. And I find mm -hmm. that resonates for all of us right now. There is, I, I, I'd like to think that we're done using the term of unprecedented times. I would assume that everyone, if not all, almost everyone on this chat is, is already vaccinated. And I thank God for that vaccine. And I thank mm -hmm. God that we're at this point, but we are living in challenging times where oh. there are plenty of people who feel that we are all Americans, but not to be Orwellian, but some are more American than others. And I wonder if you, if, if you have a message to the immigrants in this country, if you were able to gather everyone together, people who were just coming in now, people who are facing anti-Semitism, racism, anti-Asian hate, whatever the hate looks like, what would you say to them? That hatred cannot belong in our democracy. That we, I remember my mother telling me when I was older, not the baby, that she'll never forget coming into the shores of the United States and Emma Lazarus' statue give me your tired, your poor, your masses yearning to breathe free. And she was so touched by that. And we have to think as immigrants and we have to teach them. We always had to learn, you know, the statue, the, all the stuff that connects. And it's very important to teach our children to respect each other, our grandchildren. There should not be words of hate in the street. We should learn to respect people. If we don't agree on the same things, discuss it. And maybe you'll be brought in more to someone else's views. But we always sat at the table. Look, sometimes I got angry at my daddy when he had an opinion and disagreed with my opinion, and I would say, okay, I'm going, I'm not going to stay for dinner. I went and they called me back. But that's the nature of all. It if you don't agree with people, they no longer sit and have a cup of coffee together. There's no such thing. That is totally taboo in this country. If we want to keep our democracy strong, we need to commit ourselves to being united as one country with different views and different immigrants coming to us with all the laws that we need and the care that needs to be taken and simultaneously welcoming to ourselves, to our relatives, to our friends, and always thinking of tikkun ola, Repairing the world, the Hebrew phrase that has made itself into a lot of magazine articles, books. And it's so important because it's saying it's our responsibility to repair the world. Now, obviously, that's a gigantic two words. And who can repair the world? How many people does it take? We have to repair it with our children, with our grandchildren, with our family, with our community, with our political parties. It's the obligation we have upon all of us today, especially. I, I spoken like the wife of a true statesman. Are the, is the generation of statesmen over? Or are we just dealing with polarized individuals who do not understand that there is a greater common good, that your personal agenda 
is not what's going to make this country run. Where are where is the future of leadership in this country, do you feel? I think right now, the polarized individuals who are negative are doing what, look, the internet's the biggest invention to all of us. Hmm. It's turned our lives upside down simultaneously. It allows polarized people to all of a sudden have a little, their own little group underground that they're talking to. And all of a sudden they may have words of hate that are shared with these other people. So part of it is we have to, we have a lot of people who are good, kind, true American individuals and they need to be heard more. They need to speak more. And there are too many people who are fearful, some of them and going along with voices that if you really talk to them privately, I'm not sure they share. But in sharing as if they are positive, they do the worst to this country because these are loud leaders' voices. Leaders have to respect themselves and respect others. They are their, our teachers. We depend on them. And we can't be the minority. We have to be more of a group that comes together and is less frightened to speak. Wow. So true. We are afraid to speak. So many people are afraid to speak. It actually brings me to my next, my next question about public service being a family business. This, I, I've joked a million times as my husband is in a family business that unless you've been in a family business, you do not know what it's like. But I can imagine, I can only imagine that that is even more so true with a family that is dedicated to public life. So I wonder if you talk about that for a moment, both as the wife and the mother of a, of a, of a senator and a senator's children, but also somebody with her own professional life and all that that encompasses. How does, what does that look like? You know, everything that other people encounter, whether it's, you know, kids, school, problems, divorce, remarriage, all these experiences that unfortunately are not rare. We're all coping and working. Many, most women, men work today. And I mean, of course, after this year, we've had a way, there's a lot of ups and downs, but it's, they're real. And the effort that each of us as individuals have to take to have a profession to nurse a baby, to be pregnant, give birth to a baby. All of those and simultaneously make sure everything's going okay at home. Because I remember through Joe's campaigns, it's not like he was gonna prepare dinner, which he didn't do anyway, but you know. And these are the tasks that we all have to figure out and work very, very hard at to make sure that we do not neglect. And particularly if you've been divorced and remarried, you have new children, if you do. And their children, they're your children, whether you gave birth or you've taken them on as a family. And in that regard, that's why we never use the word step-parent or stepchild. We just dismiss that because you marry someone, you take on everything with them. They have children. And I understand that doesn't work for every relationship, but if they have children, they have to be your children. I would never have married anyone if I didn't know they totally accepted my son who came in with me at a young age because that was my requirement of any remarriage. 
So it's the same problems all over the place. That's part of why I wrote the book too. I wanted to talk about the challenges that divorce and remarriage and bonding and all this stuff entails. Well, at, at some point, I'm sure that whether it was a waiting for Friday night for the senator to come back from a vote or missing an event or a graduation or a recital or whatever it is, at one point, did anybody, any of the kids look at you and say, can't daddy do something else? No, never. As a matter of fact, I think Connie is what we quoted all the kids. And it was interesting because those were real quotes and you could see how they talked about problems and this and that and challenges and a divorce. We just, you know, I didn't want to be the one who's talking. I wanted my kids to speak. And the reaction to that has been very interesting. People really appreciate that we've made them all part of the story. And there was no, honey, our littlest, she was a baby. She said, my parents were at the functions at school. And she felt badly for some kids who looked out in the audience and there were no parents there. And thank God we made it, we made a point. There were times, I mean, Joe had to take a flight off to some, but he did that first and then went. And on Shabbat, we had so many different things that happened. I'll never forget. It was a Friday night and I invited some people over, assuming Joey, there'd be no problem. It was a very, very hot night. And all of a sudden I have these people coming over and Joe calls, he's not sure when he's going to be home. So what happened was he was voting, whatever. And there we're sitting down and the knock on the door, we're in the middle of the main course. And I said, oh my goodness, it's Joe. And the people at the table thought, oh, he you know, took a ride home. Well, he walked with the cops from you know, the Capitol who several of them really wanted to go with Joe because they're Bible scholars in their churches. And so they were able to discuss different things of the Bible. And he walked in, he was just wet. He washed his hands, washed his face and sat down. And I remember that and it was such a moment because it wasn't anything we had to say. Mm. They saw what it was. And sometimes we have to always remember particularly minority groups, we are our own PR. We're the public relations in the way that we act, in the way that we act to each other and to outside of our ethnic circles. It's a very important lesson. So and true. I felt, you know, I felt good about that. So true. It's such a good reminder. It's so important. To, to always be aware of our outward personas and how we do represent this nation. We have the opportunity to represent it so well on so many occasions. And that was you know, a personal proud moment. I had my Gore Lieberman sign on my front lawn and I still have my baseball cap and I still have the front page of the New York Times where the A1 uh -huh had an unbelievable headline because there was, there were the Liebermans and they were such wonderful representations of us as a people. And they were getting it done. They were giving, they were rolling up their sleeves. And I do mean they, because it is a family business. And I thought it was so poignant how your husband wrote the forward and Megan McCain wrote a, you know, the contribution at the end, she wrote the afterword and talk about another family who knows what patriotism is yes. and knows what family yes. sacrifice is. And so to have your story book ended by those two individuals is incredible. Oh, thank you so much. And you really, you know, I'm very into this book. So it brings tears to my eyes. It really well, does. I appreciate what you just said. This is an incredible book, and I do want to, though it's taking a lot of um, strength on my part, I do want to discuss your trip to the camps 
And, um, and I will tell you on a very personal note, it is something I am terrified to do. And I am not the children of survivors, nor the grandchildren, grandchild of a survivor. I'm not. And yet there is an absolute palpable fear that I have of going to the camps, even though my two oldest have gone as part of their end yeah. of se seminary overseas and spending the year in Israel. But you write something in this book, in this, in this chapter, which is, which is after the photographs. So we know you now. And so you write in chapter seven, it's called A Stone from Auschwitz. And there's one line, and trust me, there are a lot of unbelievable lines in this section. And I cannot imagine what it took for you to write this chapter. But you write, let me take you with me. And I literally felt like you were putting out your hand and saying to me, Miriam, let's go. We have to do this. I am the child of survivors. You think this is painful? You think this is painful for you? I am the child of survivors. Let me take you with me. And I was, I was so struck because at this point in the book, I really felt like I knew you. you this, they're so, this book is so personal and it's so real that I said to myself, okay, I'll go with you. And I read the chapter and I was so taken by your experience, but also you, the, 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 the clear responsibility you felt towards people like me to bring me with you on that journey. I, I was totally taken by that selflessness. Mary, you have to go yourself, but not alone. You have to go with a group that you want to be with. And even if it's not a group you would normally be with, they may themselves be survivors. They may be grandchildren of survivors. They just may be others who are going there. You know, when you go there, you see Poles and different nationalities from all over the world coming to see something they haven't seen. But being who you are and being such a representative of the Jewish people in and of yourself, you should go with the right group, find the right group and go. But I'm so thankful that your children went. So even if nothing else happened, that in itself is a mark and that's for the next generation. And it's funny because our youngest, it keeps talking about third generation. Well, our youngest who made Alian is in Israel. I've heard that there are many third generations that feel it, I feel it still as kids. And they didn't go to any of these places, but their grandparents had been there. So it was an important, I did that article on it. It was in the congressional record. And my trip to Auschwitz was amazing. And I was with a group that included, you know, people from the Holocaust Museum I knew and others. And I saw, I saw my mother's bunk that she had talked about. I saw the latrines where she was talking about the whipping that took place on her sister's head, one of her sisters. And the, she wrote about that in her diary as she came in, you know, she saw her mother. Oh, but it's pushed, course, it's one, and it depends uh, okay. from here to the, Okay, I will keep talking. <laughs> and okay, that's okay. And she, she just saw the division in the lines and all of a sudden she was taken to another line and she said to the guard, I want my mother, I want to see my mother. He said, you'll see her at the end of the day. They're going to bring everyone together. And they had sent her and others to the line to be killed. So that's, you know, those are the memories that are articulated or read by many of us. And yet we are strong 
And so someone like you, a strong Jew, has to go to show your face and defiance. We need defiance in our face and we need people to understand never again, never again will we allow this to happen. We'll do whatever we need to do, literally, never again. You write on page 88. I should just stop for one second. We encourage questions. Um, and Mary, then, Mary, Mary, before you begin the questions, that can I just say, you know, when the interview's oh. over, I just need to say something first. Yeah, no problem. Uh, so I'll, I'll revert back to you, Gail, in a minute. No problem. So Hadassah, on page 88 at the end of this chapter, you write, I had to go. No matter how much you read and how much you hear about it and how much you talk to your family, even if you are as close to the Holocaust as a child of survivors, you have to go there and see this horrendously evil, evil, evil place that stinks in its profanity, that is so ugly that it shakes your belief in everything, your belief in mankind and your faith in God. And you yes. won't understand, but you will know. And I think it's so important that differentiation between understanding and knowing. Right. It's, it's an incomprehensible experience, but you know that it's happened. And I, I, I appreciate it. It's a, literally a total of eight words. And you won't understand, but you will know that the, pro, the, the profound nature of those two sentences is huge. It's huge. And part of the problem, my father, Elvishalem, used to say, no one will understand it for a thousand years. They won't understand it. Well, and we're already at a point where people are denying it. I mean, it's the absurdity of life. But we, we can't, we can hear the facts. We can see the pictures. We, it's so overwhelming. The more I learn, the less I understand. But I am proud of my people. I'm proud of one of my dear friends as an artist, Mindy Wiesel, made Aliyah in Israel. And I used to always envy her ability. She's a painter and she could express some of her questions, some of all those difficulties you have to explain things in art, in, in colors and shapes. Whereas the rest of us do the best we can. And so that's why I needed to write this book. And that's why I always say we're um, Sabbath observant and kosher, but it's our obligation as a traditional family, as traditional Jews, to open ourselves up, whether it's a seat at our table, Shabbat table, whether it's a meal at our house, to people who don't believe or who question, because our history forces some people to come to that conclusion, to come to that question, and no one has the answers. There's no answer. And we have to respect each other, even when there are no answers, or even when these were the answers we held on to. Wow. All I can say is wow. Um, I've already been too greedy with time. I've okay. asked more questions than I've sort of been allotted and sort of been asked to use. Um, we're, I'm going to turn to Gail in one second. I want to thank you for this book. I want to thank you for sharing yourself with everyone, both on this Zoom and in writing. And I very much do believe that copies need to belong in every home. I don't mean just Jewish home. I don't need, I don't mean just home of immigrants. We all come from somewhere in this country, but every single person who hails themselves as an American, whatever generation you are, needs to own a copy of this book. And I thank you for your time. Gail. Thank you, Miriam. Thank much you. appreciated. I mean it. I was muted and unfortunately was not able to introduce Miriam L. Wallach, who's interviewing Hadassah. 
Before I begin, uh, one of the things that Miriam alluded to, uh, please write any questions you may have in the chat area, and as time allows, Miriam will read them to Hadassah when I'm done. Miriam is a general manager of the Nakam Siegel Network, NSN. Miriam holds a master's in education from the Bank Street College of Education and a master's in English from Brooklyn College. At, after a successful career as a middle school English teacher, Miriam's career evolved and became media broadcast driven. And she was hired by NSN in 2012. She hosts That's Life, Thursday, 10.30 a.m. Eastern Time, and can be found on Thursday Live Lunch, Thursdays at 11 a.m. Eastern Time, hosted by Nakam Siegel. Miriam and her husband are the proud parents of six children and live in Woodmere, New York. Now, Miriam, please take over. Okay, I like to say six children and one amazing son-in-law. I don't know how to include that in the bio though. That's, that's so, a fine way of doing it. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so let's go to some questions. We have a question here, uh, a question for Hadassah. If Joe had become the president of the United States and you had become first lady, how would you have handled the task of creating the White House Christmas decorations? Oh, you know, look, We've been asked that question before. We would have to have everyone included. And what does that mean? There would have to be the Christmas decorations that had to be included, the Hanukkah decorations, the Islamic, you know, the um, everything. Kwanzaa. Yeah. And Eid. Exactly. And, right. Right. So you'd have to do that. But you, I would want to explain things, the differences, or just be a little more um, interested in the research behind things. And to bring people, you, you couldn't, you're the president, you got to go with whatever it is. And so you do everything. Knowledge is right. power. Knowledge is power right. and knowledge begets understanding. So using that as a we, we, what we like to call in the classroom, a teachable moment. Right. It's a teachable moment and that's how I would handle it. Amazing. And probably you want representatives from each of these communities to talk about stuff when there's, celebrations go on. There's another question posted. This is, um, this is like quintessential Jewish geography. My husband and I made Aliyah in 2018. This is from Karen Rebo. My husband and I made Aliyah in 2018. Hani and her family sat right behind us on the flight. How are they doing? Oh, they're great. Thanks for asking. They have their little boy, baby, and he's not quite two. And all the kids, they have great Hebrew and they love it. And they've been at you know a few different places and going to a different place. They keep switching because they want to sing a little quieter. And everything's great. I have to tell her. Wait, what's your what's her name? Did you say? Oh, Karen, yeah, Karen Revo. Karen Revo. I'll tell <laughs> Honey. And that's so funny. That's but great. They're great. Thank God, they're great. Have you been able to post COVID? Have you been able to be back? Oh yeah, we went, Joe had some meetings with the foreign ministry of Israel before Pesach. So I went with them and we stayed through Pesach, which was really wonderful. And we hope we'll be back in the fall. Joe has a book that, his Shabbat book, which was just translated into Hebrew. Wow. So, you know, we thought that'll be interesting. That should be very interesting. Yes. Um, a follow-up question on my own. After completing the book, which I have to imagine, I've never written a book, though other authors have likened it to childbirth. And <laughs> so is there, is that a good, is that a good uh, assessment? Well, it's, you know, I wouldn't say the pain is childbirth, but I wouldn't say it's likened to childbirth. What happens is you have to really give up on your ego for a while because 
there are rejections from some people and the publish it goes on and on and on. You have to have an ego that can withstand all the barrels of confusion, of disagreement. It's just hard. And plus people, you know, the publishing business is going toward getting books that can publish mega publish otherwise it's not worth it for him so you know it's a hard press i was blessed with brandeis university and really felt a connection with them because after all they were the university when we weren't we jews were not getting into all the universities so i thought my book would be great in their context I, I completely agree. I'm a big fan of Brandeis and certainly I love everything about Massachusetts. You being a New Englander, I can oh, yes. uh, I can speak to that. I take drives to New Haven just to clear my head. There's nothing like it in my opinion. There's nothing and, like it. And we were there for years for a while when Joe was the attorney general. Yeah, so it's a nice place. Absolutely. I want to, I, I know we have like a minute left. I, I okay. don't want to, um, or I, I feel it's appropriate to conclude with uh, the memorial page. Oh. The and yes, it is not to be, it is not to be overlooked. While most people and many people just quickly flip to get to the page that they're looking for, this page is a is an absolute testament to everything that you speak about and um i i i wonder for a second number one how many of these names have been passed down how many of these names have been named for um and and also how hard was it for you to amass this list well i i had a list from other occasions that were needed, my dad's memorial book. And so I knew, and there's a man who lives in Riverdale, who's Davis, his name was Davidovich. And so Rachel Veter Davidovich, you know, so some of the names have repeated themselves. So it was, look, there are so many other names I could have included but then you have to just watch how far you go. And many of those names for children, for cousins. And we're just hoping in the future, we don't have so many to record except from natural death. And I did it, I'm glad it's here. And that's why saying American story was an important ending up because the truth is thank god it was a lighted american story i mean my 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 continued thanks to you for for your story and for your time today my thanks to everyone at barilan i wish everyone a wonderful day and may we continue uh, and I'm may good. we continue to be metakain the olam. Thank you. Gail. Okay, Miriam, thank you for your thought-evoking interview. And thank you, Hadassah, for sharing your story with us. And thank you for your work. Please. Next to you, it pales. Today yeah. was just a glimpse into Hadassah's story. I too highly recommend Hadassah's book, which is available on Amazon. I'd like to thank you all for joining us today. This special webinar is part of a series in which we bring bar Ilan University live to your homes and share with you cutting edge research and scholarship, as well as life stories such as the one we heard today. I hope that you will join me in supporting bar Ilan. Please visit afbiu.org slash donate. Your generous support is critical and deeply appreciated. Thank you so much. That concludes my remarks. Thank you all.
Thank you, Miriam. Thank you, Adana Thank you, Asa. Thank you everyone for coming.